Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Tom. And thank you also to the RBA and AUB for giving me this opportunity to give you this talk today. So I'm going to dive straight into my talk as I have quite a lot of slides to go through. And I start off in South East London, which is where I grew up, um, which was close to three parks. And while it was a reasonably densely populated part of London, I, it was broken up by these large green open spaces, which I was always drawn to. Growing up in the capital didn't really feel as if I lived in a big city. It was very much an edge of city environment. Travelling into central London at that time, we referred to as travelling into London. So this gives you a sense of how removed we felt from the urban centre. These were the 1980s and 90s, the days before the Jubilee Line extension and the DLR. And while I, like many thousands of visitors to Greenwich Park, have admired this historic view over the years, the view I remember most growing up was the middle image when the, the only tall structure that stood on the horizon was one Canada Square Tower. The skyline here has changed dramatically since then, and equally the London Docklands has transformed. Now sitting at the top of Greenwich Park, the skyline is part of the immediate context. The old and the new have found a way of sitting comfortably alongside each other. And in stark contrast to that 1990s skyline, there is now a sense of the city being brought to the doorstep of Greenwich itself. It's practically inescapable, but equally alluring. Where I live today couldn't be any different from the urban landscape of London. I live in a small town, Livington, where the New Forest National Park meets the Salent. I have a nature reserve just beyond the end of my road, and I work within a multitude of conservation areas, areas of outstanding natural beauty and triple SIs. Most of the buildings within the town centre are of a historic nature and many are nationally or locally listed. We don't have anything high rise, so the story of how I arrived here, if you like, is one of contrasts. Well, my route into architecture was pretty conventional. I spent a few summers gaining work experience at a couple of local architectural practices in Greenwich. And upon finishing my A-levels, embarked on a degree at Portsmouth University's School of Architecture. The school at that time was in the Portland building, which was just four years old then, and purpose-built by the late Sir Colin Stansford Smith, the Hampshire County Council architects. It was fresh and bright with a very fluid plan and you could see from one space into another. For students of architecture, it was a fantastic place to study with all the key spaces under one roof, the lecture hall, the library, the workshop, and a central forum space for events. As students, we were incredibly fortunate to have some very inspiring tutors who pushed us to maximise our potential and without limitation. This often gets lost in the real world of practice, but the concept-driven ethos of the school has stayed with me throughout my architectural career. And I believe you should always push your design ability, even when faced with the toughest of obstacles. Like many architects, I am often intrigued by how architects draw inspiration to their work. Some take it from nature, others from art or sculpture. But my inspiration has typically been born out of everyday experiences, travel, articles, or typically from site features or site history. An example of past travel was a part one trip to Switzerland, which opened my eyes to the works of Peter Zumter. I was fortunate enough to stay at Berne Vals, which was a major turning point for me educationally in learning about what it is to achieve the ultimate in sensory architecture, where the visual appeal of a building and its internal spaces has just as much impact as how a building makes you feel, what you hear and what you smell. Visiting his works, I saw the beauty in their simplicity, how to use natural light, and how I admired his innate ability to create buildings that appear as if they have always stood there since the beginning of time. I've also gained inspiration from attending other architects' lectures. One in, one in particular, given by Sir David Chipperfield in the early noughties, 
introduced me to his competition winning proposal to extend San Michele Cemetery in Venice. The poetry and the sophisticated design somehow became the inspiration for my part two dissertation while studying at Bath University nearly five years later. Two weeks in Venice, followed by research and writing the dissertation, was the best part of the course for me, and I discovered a new love for academic writing, which I was to rediscover ten years later. Compared to the many prestigious projects I have previously worked on, such, such as the Manchester Civil Justice Centre for Denton Corker Marshall and Kensington and Chelsea College for Ditson Jones, the scale of the projects and the size of the teams working on these projects were often large and at part one level you only really tend to work on a small part of them. So it was a great opportunity for me to be offered to run my own, my own project at Ditson Jones, which was to extend their offices. And I was also fortunate enough to work on a large scale housing project in DCN's Melbourne office during my last three months before touring Australia. So my part, post part one time in, in practice was incredibly rewarding, varied and insightful. Post part two, my experience in practice was spent in commercial practices, working on large, pro, large office projects and working on the new student centre and the School of Architecture for Oxford Brooks University by Design Engine Architects. However, I recognised that big buildings didn't excite me as much as small scale projects and long term downsizing to a smaller office environment would appeal much more, especially as I was wanting to start my part three. While my initial experience was spent in larger practices, reflecting on this now shows where you start off is not necessarily where you end up. However, the experience gained along the way is still so incredibly valid. I arrived at PED Studio in 2011, which enabled me to gain a lot of experience working on private houses and gave me the opportunity to learn about running projects and the planning policies associated with working in a new forest. This is where I completed my part three, took on a project architect role and discovered I loved the smaller office environment. But what became apparent was working in a smaller office meant my role encompassed many other aspects of practice life as well, which I hadn't been exposed to before. It was certainly the most influential practice to my work today, but while working there, things turned quiet as we were still recovering from the financial crash of 2008. I was working part time then, so this allowed me to do other things on my days off, which included teaching first year students at Bath Uni, which is an incredibly rewarding experience and working on my first private project, which happened to arrive in quite a timely fashion. While I had a lot of experience by this point working in New Forest National Park, it was by sheer coincidence the site for my first project was located in another national park, Dartmoor. The site is in a very traditional hamlet where no examples of contemporary architecture exist, but what was initially apparent was the simple palette of colours and materials throughout the area, white render, dark cladding and either slate roof tiles or thatched roofs. The project was brought to me via family friends and I would say family has been intrinsic to where I am today and how the practice has developed. I found it encouraging that the owners embrace contemporary architecture and are willing to cha challenge the norms of what is typically expected by Dartmoor National Park Authority. The grief for the project was to produce a new entrance hall, to relocate the staircase and critically to provide a wheelchair accessible bathroom for their daughter who suffers from MS. This was a tiny gem of a project on a 70 grand budget, but that challenge excited me. The form of the proposal was simple, a side extension that followed the angle of the site boundary. The nature of the site meant the form became narrower towards the front, and this allowed it to appear, appear more discreet when viewed from the main road. The solution was far more contemporary than the surrounding buildings, However, rather surprisingly, Dartmoor National Park Authority supported a contemporary response purely because it wasn't trying to look like the original dwelling. And from a conservation perspective, the history of the building could easily be read. 
We use Douglas fir cladding as the external wall finish and finish it in a dark stain to pick up on the darker tones found within the Hamlet's houses. And the entire interior was painted white to give the feeling of space, light and tight. The cross section is all about bringing light in from above. Due to the proximity to other houses, we had to make all windows but one obscured to prevent overlooking onto other properties. So we chose to introduce two large roof lights to brighten up the internal spaces and to give the main entrance space a more gallery-like feel. This project was for a kitchen dining room extension in Livington. The owners who are in their late 70s wanted something contemporary to fit in with their 1950s house, but also wanted the interior to be light and bright, but without it overheating as it is south facing. They also wanted a sliding door to create a seamless transition between the outside and the inside. Lighting within the internal environment of our buildings is really important and we spend a lot of time considering how we can introduce natural light and in creative ways. On this project we introduced three roof lights that sit at different angles to one another and one of them sits where the extension adjoins the house which would otherwise have been the darkest space in the floor plan. We had a palette of just three materials, zinc, timber and stone. The timber we used here was sweet chestnut, which we introduced into the facade, then brought it internally and to introduce some colour and texture. We also tend to be asked to design the artificial lighting in our projects, which I love as you can be creative with what you choose to define and enhance. This project is from the early days of the practice. The owner has the most fabulous garden, and at the end of it is a woodland which he also owns. The house at the rear was much, very much cut off from the garden, and he was keen for the house and landscape to have a much better connection to bring the outside in. We introduced a 60 square metre extension on the back of the property where we located the kitchen, dining and living areas in one large open plan space. And this then opened up onto a terrace to overlook the garden. We always aim to have an understated and effortless approach to our projects and find the use of natural materials helps with this. The use of Iroko in this project allowed, allowed us to bring texture, warmth and colour to a simple palette and the limestone enabled us to connect the house with the garden seamlessly, which is what the owner was after. And we are now working on another project for the owner's son. No part of architectural education or training really prepares you for running your own business. It's definitely something I've had to learn on my feet. And gaining my first project meant I had to do grown up things like source PI insurance, find an accountant and register the practice. And that's because a significant turning point came for me shortly after Meadow Cottage gained planning approval. I was asked to get involved in a project for a designer furniture company and starting on this enabled me to go full time running the practice. The site is set within the Cricket St Thomas estate in a picturesque landscape in Somerset, but it was semi-industrial and its immediate setting was overgrown. The end user client was Maida's Furniture, who are British furniture manufacturers and work with international designers such as Sir Kenneth Grange. While they have a base in London, the manufacturing side of things has always been located in Somerset and they approached me to design their new headquarters and convert an existing warehouse building into their furniture factory. 
The main architectural ideas were to add in two mezzanine spaces, retain some areas of double height space, and if the site could only enjoy views from one direction due to site constraints, give some focus to the front elevation arrangement, which was effectively creating a new corporate identity for the company. So to briefly run through the plan, the office sits towards the front in a new building and the factory is located to the rear in an existing warehouse, which we then converted and extended. While this wasn't a conservation project, its setting was incredibly sensitive. And of course, thinking about what the project did for the practice, it was fairly large and it was non-domestic, so it made our portfolio look a little more diverse. It's typical for clients to be on a fixed budget and this project was no exception. However, I was tasked with designing virtually everything on the project, which included the lighting design, as we didn't have a services engineer on board. Being a big fan of timber, as you can probably gauge, I introduced Idigbo within the facade as well as internally. I also made a conscious decision, like in all our projects, to limit the palette of materials and make the timber the feature material. This helped to soften the industrial nature of the building and somehow brought a slightly more domestic scale to the project instead. Modus were on a tight schedule as they were still leasing their former site. So the project was in construction while I was working on the detailed design information. Sometimes there just wasn't time to draw this information in CAD so I had to resort to hand sketching details instead, as this was much faster. It was also fortunate that the main contractor had a joining workshop in-house, so they made all of the windows, the vent panels, the window seat and other joining on the project. So the main image on the top right shows the factory space in full production. Apart from integrating services and lighting in here, we introduce roof lights to flood the working environment with natural light. The bottom right hand image shows the main office space with its new Idigbo window seat to the front and the other image was me sitting in the canteen. This slide shows the main conference room and the furniture showroom, which sits on one of the mezzanines. And again, this was one of those key spaces where we could introduce a little more of the timber into the space. And these photos show the building completed and in operation. By the time the project was awarded planning permission, I got around to having that all important website designed, which was to become the best investment I've made for the business. As a result, I began to get frequent project inquiries while still working on the Modus project and very soon became incredibly busy. And busy is good. Busy means you're making money and making money means you can invest in other things. So I started to get involved with model making, high quality visuals, as a picture paints a thousand words, and these became useful for planning applications or for general marketing purposes. I also invested in professional photography once projects were completed, because great project photos make for a great portfolio. I recognised quite quickly that photos of built projects go a long way with convincing potential clients they should invest in your services as this gives them confidence you can deliver their ambitions. And over the years, these things have helped to shape the practice's image. Conservation wasn't an area of architecture I had considered much before starting the practice, but given our location and the number of heritage projects we have been involved with over the years, I began to take a serious interest in it. One project located in the middle of Limington's conservation area is the Photographer's Studio, which is the smallest site we have ever had. But I've 
but also a project we can confidently say shows you can always get something interesting out of a project, no matter its size. It's located within the garden of a grade two listed house and the owner wanted the studio not only for photography, but also to utilise it to process his photos. It's an interesting site because it sits alongside many other listed buildings towards the front, but towards the rear, the site is semi-industrial where boat building takes place. It became immediately apparent that we could use the original garden wall as the external wall of the studio. Timber frame is our preferred method of construction as it is low energy, a low energy solution. And in this project, we dropped the frame into the inside of the garden wall. I then just had to think about the roof form and how that would sit. We chose to integrate a metal roof to fit in with the industrial nature of the area behind the site and considered copper and zinc as possible lightweight options, but settled for weathered steel because its colouring fitted in with the more traditional materials found in and around the site. The external walls all sit at differing angles to one another, so a regular shaped roof wouldn't have worked. It meant all four sides of the roof were at different angles and lengths as well. A bit of a headache for the main contractor and weathered steel manufacturer, but they still managed to achieve what we set out to do. We utilise the pre-app service of the planning department as we do with all our projects as it allows us to start a dialogue with the, the planning team. And typically, this has been a favourable part of our process with our clients. And the section shows on this slide our general approach to the reef design, which was to give it a floating appearance, appearance by introducing clear story windows above the garden wall. The roof overhang also helps to control how much light enters in through the, those windows as well. <coughs> It's important when integrating contemporary architecture into a heritage context that you achieve some level of balance with the design, but critically that you recognise the significance of the heritage asset and the subservience of the new addition. We also believe in producing architecture that reflects the time in which we live in, architecture that is honest and clearly different to the existing. So with that in mind and the lateral mindset of the conservation officer on the project, our planning journey was made fairly easy. The top image on this slide is the private garden side of the studio and the bottom image is the public or civic side. Colour in particular is something we enjoy making a statement with in our projects. Uh, in our practice, we feel you can create a sensitive design response and still create something beautiful and unexpected. We are not afraid to introduce an element of surprise. And this harks back to that concept driven approach I mentioned back from my Portsmouth days. The roof construction was a warm roof with a single ply membrane and we used integrated fixing points discreetly located to sit beneath the weathered steel, which would connect it to the rest of the roof. We were hoping the weathered steel could be cut in a single sheet, but it just couldn't be manufactured that way. So we then had to consider how each side would sit. And we settled for five pieces on each side. Now entering our ninth year, we have learned to understand what we value in design, such as working with natural and traditional materials, and also working in particularly sensitive and historic contexts. This is what challenges us to come up with interesting design responses and enables us to grow our reputation in this field. We are also quite interested in combining traditional crafts with our contemporary architectural approach, which work very well alongside each other. However, in some locations, our hands can be really tied, trying to fit in with a strictly traditional landscape. And we can come face to face with many obstacles, such as parish councils, 
difficult neighbours or locals who just don't like change. And then there are times we get completely surprised that those groups presumed to give us a hard time turn out to welcome our approach as the best way forward, which is the response we received from locals on a new built house in the National Park. Sorry, Richard, could you go back one? Thank you. This project is ecologically driven and the house almost takes second place to the landscape. It's a completely inert landscape and our proposal was to rewild the site using specific soil composition and only planting species of plants native to this part of the leaf forest. We also proposed to integrate bird boxes within the brick wall, which you enter through, and where you would hear the sounds of tweeting birds occasionally. And the central internal courtyard spaces we proposed were for non-native species like lavender and rosemary, scented plants, which is a way of introducing another dimension to our sensory architectural approach on the project. I finished the presentation on this visual, on the visual for this project, so you will get a sense of how integral the landscape design was to the scheme. Finding myself living near the borders of Dorset and Wiltshire, and having worked on so many projects that are of a heritage nature, I started to consider conservation on a more academic level. These are the before photographs of the Banana Store project, a grade two listed former print works turned storage building for a fruit and veg wholesaler business. We call it the Banana Store because it was a nice cool space to store bananas. It has been within the ownership of my husband's family for three generations, but for the last 30 years or so fell into disrepair as it just wasn't maintained. The project was to convert the building into a dwelling, and at that time it contained a large quantity of asbestos and was generally in a very poor condition. The roof tiles on the front of the house had to be secured using mesh to prevent them from falling onto passers-by, so the building was in a pretty dangerous condition as well. The section shows how we divided the building up with a hallway on the roadside at upper floor level and bedrooms behind. And beneath that was the living room. Then a kitchen dining space, which is all in a single story part of the property. And that was in the original flint faced masonry structure. And we replaced the asbestos link with zinc. This was due to be lead, but the conservation officer advised zinc as less theft was prolific in the region. It was a project that taught me a lot in relation to heritage conservation and also the one responsible for me joining the RBA conservation course at the end of 2017. A good foundation course for the subject, but at the end of it, I realised I wanted to study heritage conservation at a higher level, which I could then apply to my work. <clears throat> I've always been slightly dissatisfied with the architectural education journey and that when I'm working, I want to study and when I'm studying, I want to work. So I applied and got a place on the master's course at the Wilden Downland Living Museum the following spring. And looking back, must have been completely mad to do a master's while running the, the practice. And at that time, also having a two year old. But this is how I'm wired. And this is when I revisited that love and, of research and academic writing. And it was in doing the course, I came to appreciate the term work life balance. It was a chance to gain a better understanding of repairing and caring for different types of historic buildings, timber frame structures, masonry structures, the after effects of fire damage, and the various accepted approaches to integrating contemporary additions into historic contexts, which the museum does very well. So now I have completed my second master's. The practice has grown to the grand size of two people, soon to be three. And we are looking to continue to grow, but intend to keep the practice small. We are just about to replace our eight year old website, which has served us incredibly well. And despite the threat of COVID on the industry, we are busier than ever. Our project sites are becoming more complex 
and the projects themselves are becoming larger. We have three new build houses in planning currently and received planning approval for another just this week. We also have around 10 projects heading to construction so far this year, so things are really busy for us. However, we are still keen to work on the smaller projects as these excite us just as much as the larger ones and in some ways challenge us more. We're even designing a new staircase which will take pole position as our smallest project. But critically, we have reached the stage where we can be selective over what we take on to ensure projects remain within the vision of our ethos. And we look to a future where we can continue to challenge our ambitions by working in sensitive locations and still raise the profile of contemporary architecture. Thank you very much for your time.